going on the nice. All right. Hey everyone, I am Zyla. It's really good to meet you. I, I'm actually really happy I've met a lot of you just in the last hour as well. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I have a background in mechatronics engineering, which is basically like I couldn't decide between mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, and so I like mediocrely did both of them. Uh, and I took my degree and I became a YouTuber. So sorry, sorry, mom. I'm working on it. At least I'm paying rent. Um, so I figured I would do like a really quick video for anyone who hasn't seen my work before, so you have a little bit of context for the rest of the talk. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, Zyla here, and today we're going to be building an impossible table. Decommissioned runway light lamps. And that is all the things you need to make a rocket. Let's chinese -ify Jimmy DeResta. And I designed this monstrosity. If I know one thing about the Christmas spirit, it's about strapping giant rocket motors to things that definitely don't need them. So consider this my application to be a more galactic Miss Universe. I'm like, I don't know, I don't want to assume that anyone's seen any of my work before, so I'll just do like a, um, but if you got anything from that video, it's basically that I'm pretty much all over the place. I'm always doing whatever makes me happy, um, and that's what I want to talk about today. But I do, all right, so like a little bit of honesty, I have to come clean. I wrote this talk starting at midnight last night when I got to Birmingham, um, because I've spent the last six days walking across the Highland Way, across, like across Scotland, for basically no reason. Um, so I spent six days walking 103 miles, over the course of which I was like, I'll work on my talk. And of course, I never did. Um, and then I also want to give another disclaimer, which is like, maybe don't take really sage life advice from a 26-year-old who just walked 100 miles for absolutely no reason while procrastinating the talk that they were supposed to write, which is the reason they're in Europe in the first place. Um, or maybe do take life advice because I would argue that like that kind of spontaneous adventurous spirit is the core of what makes us makers. And it's like the, the spirit that I would encourage in any type of maker and that's the exact same approach that I take to all of my projects. So, well, yes, I just walked 100 miles for no reason and my body is in a lot of pain. So if you see me like limping around here today, that's why, didn't train for it at all. Um, but I didn't walk 100 miles for no reason, even though there's like a four hour train ride that can get you the exact same distance. I walked it for like the same reason that I built a cedar strip corset or a bulletproof dress or a party kayak that, actually this one was fun because there were some kids doing uh, illegal activities on the side of the river where I first, uh, launched this and they thought they were so much higher than they really were. It was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> or throwing like gigantic rocket motors in Christmas trees. Like arguably all of these have no reason. But I'm gonna tell you that my reason is whimsy. Uh, anyone know what whimsy is? All right, it's like wacky horrible ideas that I'm making anyway, so help me Honestly, I couldn't come up with anything for the Y, so I just Googled tools that start with Y, uh, and that was the only one I could come up with. But what I'm trying to say is that we do things, like do things for the sake of doing them. Whether it's 
walking 100 miles and screwing up your body or building a project that you can't really explain why you're doing it to anybody else, it doesn't matter. We should just do it anyway. And to be completely honest, we live in an era where basically anything we make can be purchased. Like, if, you're, if your end goal is an object that is, has a use of some kind, there's probably an Amazon link out there where you could just buy the same thing to do, to do it. And so the reason that we're all makers is because we actually enjoy the process of getting to that point. And there's, of course, like, I know this feeling very well, the ups and downs and the downs when all you're thinking about is that final product. But I know deep in all of your hearts that the final product is not why you're doing it. It's the journey to get there. Um, and so if that's the point, then I would encourage you to just build the stuff that lights your soul on fire. Like, make the things that excite you. And what I want to like convince you of all, all of today is that even if those things are outside of your perceived skill set, that doesn't matter at all. You should still try and you should still do them. I feel like I'm made of, if, if like we're going on the like soul on fire uh, analogy here, I think that I am made of like really dry pine needles and pretty much anything can light me on fire. I'm like a very excitable person. Um, but I would say that my only superpower is that I'm willing to pour gasoline on it anyway, especially if I don't know how to do something. Um, like that's the part that gets me really excited. And that's the reason that I have the career that I have and why like I'm standing up here today. So I would argue, I think I can like extremely confidently make the case that I don't have the skills that a lot of you guys have. Like I don't have hours of experience sharpening chisels or using hand tools. I don't necessarily know what I am doing per se. Um, and I also wasn't raised to build things. Like I learned how to build things only in the last couple years. Um, I, get a, I get a lot of really funny comments that are like, wow, your dad did such a good job raising, like he must have taught you so many things. Um, and my dad is awesome, like really great person. I don't think he'd know how to use a power tool if it like smacked him in the face. Uh, last year he was trying to help me install a security system in my house um, because parents are awesome. And he broke four brand new drill bits out of my brand new drill bit set trying to put a single hole in a wall. So <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't grow up doing this stuff. Um, I grew up as like a girly girl who was really liked playing with Barbies and um, in some ways that was also kind of I think what I was told to like. But I didn't have the intention of being an engineer or a maker or a creator. And I didn't discover like any of this until kind of mid high school when I joined my theater, the theater group's like tech crew. So I started building sets and that was my first introduction to tools. And while I was looking for this, I found no good pictures from this era, um, but I did find the first boat I ever built. So I think that theater is maybe also where I got the boat building bug. Um, and I vaguely remember the actors in this production complaining about how heavy this boat was and us being like, suck it up. And now as an adult, I'm looking at that three quarter inch ply or half inch ply and I'm like, dang, we really made some tiny high school girls carry that around for like an hour. Um, <laughs> but from theater, I found robotics and then um, I got really involved in robotics and became the captain of my high school's team. And so from there, I went to engineering school and honestly, none of this matters. I don't think that school is like where I learned to do a lot of this, but this is the NASA robotic mining competition team that I was a part of in college. And there's like one story from that that I really want to share. I share it in like pretty much every talk I give because I think it is one of, the, one of those moments that made me the person that I am. And this team was a mess. The uh, leadership was not super organized, as many student run teams are. And somehow as a freshman with no idea what I was doing, I was in charge of the entire electromechanical assembly of this robot and I was supposed to make the eBay for it. And so I like put together my very first CAD model of the eBay, I ordered the parts and I started assembling it and nothing fits together. Like it is an absolute disaster. We're like two weeks from competition and there's no one helping me, no older team members are mentoring me, I am just, alone with my sad pile of parts with holes in the wrong places. 
Um, it's two in the morning in this robotics lab, and I just like have a full meltdown. Like I'm crying over this robot. It's a very pathetic sight. And I had a, fr a friend at the time who was a grad student, and he was doing his master's thesis on the like electrical boxes in campus. And it just so happens he was waiting until 2:30 in the morning to to go and like take data on the one in the robotics lab because he didn't want to talk to anybody. And uh, he assumed no one would be there. So he busts open the door at 3 in the morning, and there's this like crying freshman girl with this robot. And now he's like, Shh, I have to like help this person. So he goes, Zyla, what's wrong? And I was like, I got put in charge of these parts. Nothing fits together. Everything's terrible. I'm a failure. I'm a terrible engineer. Like, How could I have done this? How could I have not seen this coming? And he looked at me and was like, you played an instrument growing up, right? And I was like, yeah, like, played, played the violin. He was like, well, how many hours a day did you practice that instrument? And I said, oh, I don't know, an hour or two. And he was like, how many hours a day have you practiced engineering? How many hours a day have you practiced building stuff and making stuff? Um, and I was like, none at all. Uh, and he was like, there you go. You can't like, expect yourself to suddenly have all the hours of practice that the seniors and the grad students on this team do. This is just part of that practice. And that was like a complete change in mentality for me. And I had this like new mindset of not needing perfection on the first try. I'm allowed to, like, if everything is practice, then I'm allowed to make mistakes and just keep working towards this like nebulous goal that doesn't actually really exist. And what it did is it, it let me start pri trying projects that were completely outside of the scope of what I was doing before. Um, so, and here's the thing, is that robot eventually went together. This is us at NASA. My part didn't break. Other people's stuff broke, but my part didn't break. <laughs> and I have to, like, it wasn't pretty. There is silicone caulk in places on that eBay. I don't want to admit to you. Like, everything was hacked together and, pe like, piecemealed. But the reality is, like, I put the hours in. I banged my head against a wall for a lot of extra days, and I made it work. And I learned a lot of really important lessons. And so getting to the answer in the first time around is not the important part. And I'm, I, I've been struggling on how to get this like, point across in this talk. But in general, I think when I make things, the things that I don't have are like general knowledge for the most part. A lot of times I will jump into a project having no idea what I'm doing and also no plan. Um, I make extremely willing to start a project having no idea how it's gonna end, but what I do have is a trust in myself to figure it out. And that's what that like, robotics experience taught me was that it doesn't matter if I don't know the answer going into something, there is always a solution that I am capable of figuring out. And I think if you can get that into your head of saying, I don't need to know how to do this thing, I just have to trust myself to have the tenacity to work through it, then you can build literally anything. And it's not to just keep bringing West Highland Way pictures back, but like that's where my brain's been at for the last week. But I would say it's exactly the same thing as something like the West Highland Way. Like you don't know if you can walk 100 miles in a row until you do it. And then here's the thing is that once you've started, even when your feet are in a lot of pain and you have blisters, you have the momentum to just keep going. And so like your body is going to be capable of so much more than what you thought as long as you don't think too hard about the fact that it's 100 miles when you're still on mile one. You, that like is not just physical. I think like sports metaphors and physical metaphors are a lot easier. Um, and so I'm going to, of course, bring it right back to, to that. Um, I think a, an example of this outside of projects is um, I if it's not immediately obvious by the fact that I wrote this talk last night, procrastinate a good amount. And uh, I, booked the, I booked this trip like less than two weeks ago. And when I was calling around looking for like luggage transfer and accommodations and hostels along the West Highland Way, all of the companies that book it for you were like, it is literally impossible to book this trip a week out. Um, <laughs> most people book over a year ahead of time. What on earth are you thinking? And I was like, ah, there's going to be a way. And so, and so this is like the typical route. And uh, instead of hiking from like Milgai to Drimmen to Roardnant, like these cities, I just 
picked completely new cities, committed to doing like 25 miles the first day, catching a ferry at like midday across the lake to a, like a hostel on the other side of the lake, coming back. Um, but there was a solution, and I made it work. And that's kind of the point that I want to get across with your projects, is that there always is a solution, even if it's not the solution that you really wanted. Um, so my project example for this is my teardrop trailer. Has anyone seen that video? OK. Some people. Um, so the, I, I think I have to be a little careful about what I say. So I had three weeks to build this project. When I initially pitched it to the sponsor, it was four months out. And then stuff happened. I had three weeks to design and build this entire trailer from scratch. So I gave myself two days to design the trailer. So day one, I read a book about trailers. Day two, I put some stuff in CAD. And you can imagine that like, what you can design of an entire tiny house is in one day is not very high. And so by the time I started cutting wood, I had no plan for the doors. I had no plan for the skylight. I just knew that it had to have doors. It had to have windows. And it had to, I wanted it to have a skylight, because I thought like a stargazer window would be really cool. Um, I had no plan for the kitchen, nothing. All I knew is I had like a plan for the walls, for the structure, and a loose idea, and, and the shape, and the swoop. The swoop was like the first thing, the aluminum swoop on the side was like the first thing I designed, because priorities. Um, and so the entirety of this three-week build, like, do you think I was in my comfort zone? It was just pure panic the entire time, because every single day is problem solving a solution that I didn't think about in the design process at all. Um, so absolutely not. I was like floundering. I spent, I opened and closed Home Depot pretty much every day of that build of getting parts to fix a problem that I had caused the afternoon before. But at the same time, I would argue that being outside of my comfort zone is like more comfortable than being inside of my comfort zone. Therefore, like, I maybe was in my comfort zone the whole time. Does that make sense? Has anyone experienced that feeling? OK. So next, next year at this talk, I probably won't get invited to give another talk. But uh, you know, I want to see everyone's hand get raised. Because I think learning to be comfortable outside of your comfort zone is like the superpower of being a creative maker. And so I will also, I bet every single one of you Looked at, who like, looked at this project and thought, I couldn't make that. That's too big of a project. If you saw this thing in person, there are like five to 10 things that every single one of you could make better than what exists on the trailer. Um, those are, some of those things are things I didn't show super <laughs> detailed up in my video. Um, but whether it's like the windows, coming up with a better design for the windows, or the doors, or the skylight, or the trim, you all have the skill to do a better job than what I did. And so if you have the skill in just that one section, why not like, add them all together into the full project? And when you think about it like that, I think it's a lot less intimidating of a project. Um, <laughs> so to prove my point, this is actually what it looked like the first time I took it out on the road. This is my first gas stop in the trailer. Um, the windows started flooding around so much on the highway that I literally just masking taped them shut because the, the latches didn't work very well. Um, but that's my point. And like the next time I took the trailer out, that problem was solved. So it's really like everything can be an iterative, creative process. That's kind of the point of what I'm trying to get across is that when you start a project, you don't have to know where it's going. Like The only reason I'm good at what I do is because I don't care that I don't know how a project is going to end when I start it. And I'm willing to just jump in and go on the journey and walk that 100 miles for no reason. And the only skill and preparation that you need to tackle a project that you think is too hard for you or outside of that, the scope of like what you already know how to do is a complete trust in yourself to figure it out. Because you can figure it out. Like Every single person has the capability to build something harder than what they've ever built before, because that's like who we are as people. Um, you just have to trust yourself to get there. 
Uh, so I don't know. Hopefully that was <laughs> informational or helpful in some way. Um, and I think we are wanting to do questions now. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Hello. Zyla, you're really creative. You've got lots of energy. You're problem solving. Um, do you have ADHD? As a licensed pilot, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> okay, a, a second part to that question. <laughs> so for, for all the kids who, like me, diagnose with dyslexia and ADHD, um, a lot of us had our creativity and our energy squashed by the uh, school system. Do you have any advice for them? Um, screw them? Uh, okay, I, I am dancing. I, <laughs> I have never been formally diagnosed with anything. I hold an active pilot's license in the United States. Uh, gonna preface there. Um, I did feel very much like the school system did not work for me, and that's why I sought extracurricular activities constantly. Like, I did not do very well in school at all. Is this? Okay. Um, I didn't do very well in school at, at, at all. Um, around, like, mid to early high school, my grades really started dropping. And, like, a, a lot of my value as a successful person, particularly, not to, like, bring race into it, but particularly as an Asian immigrant family, it, like, grades in school is really, really important um, because it's kind of your way out. And... So like as self-value dropped, I found things like robotics, I found theater, I found places where I could contribute in a way that was like physically meaningful. And um, I ended up just leaning on those to carry me through. And so like, sure, maybe I didn't go to the kind of like a college that uh, like my, you know, Chinese immigrant family would have wanted me to, but I still went on a robotics scholarship um, because I found something that I was passionate about. And to be completely honest, I had like a really eye-opening moment at my high school reunion of being like, wow, I'm actually one of the only people I graduated with that is spending every day of my life doing something I'm really, really passionate about and that I care about and I love my job and I'm still like paying rent and, and being like successful in the ways that our families wanted us to. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. Hi, Zyla. Hello. Hello. Um, given the fantastic but eclectic nature of your projects, as you've quite rightly put forward in your presentation, where do you look for inspiration and how do you decide what to do next? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, can I give a really like obnoxiously vague answer? <laughs> I think the, uh, the question, I don't know, I, I'm having trouble hearing, so I'll just repeat it, uh, was where do I look for inspiration for my projects? Because I'm so all over the place. And I would say if you have your, your mind open enough and your eyes open enough in the way, I don't, I don't know if I did like a really good job conveying what I mean <laughs> in this talk of just being like every single thing is possible if you think it's possible. And so like suddenly the whole world will open up to you as possibilities. Like, if I'm, you know, just perusing Instagram stories and I see something, or I'm traveling um, and I see something, or like a creator that I admire a lot has made something similar. I don't know, there's a whole world of things to, to choose from. And if you don't pigeonhole yourself, so like, that, I think that's what I'm trying, I was trying to say is like, I've never pigeonholed myself as like, I only work with wood, or I only make cutting boards, or I only make boats. Um, I was like, ah, when I feel like making boats, I make a boat, and when it's wedding gift season, I'll make a cutting board, and when, um, you know, I feel like doing something more chemistry related, I'll make transparent wood, like, when, whenever something catches my eye, it's, it gets added to my like sticky note list of things I'm considering doing. Um, instead of starting from a point of being like, I am a woodworker, therefore, what is a woodworking project I can do next? I think it's like an inverse cycle. What was your favorite build? Who's my favorite? What, what was your favorite build? What is my favorite build? Oh my god. Uh, that's like asking a parent what their favorite child is. Do you know how mean that is? <laughs> um, I think 
My answer to this question is different every single time someone asks it of me. Um, I think right now my answer would be the rocket projects. So like the first um, Fifi, the, the first one rocket I did, that launch is where I met some of my best friends. And then we've launched a lot of rockets together since then. And I think a lot of times projects to me are associated with like the people that I meet in as part of that journey. And those people have become really important to me. And they're also people who have like gotten me through a lot of hard stuff in the last couple of years. So even though the project itself I don't think is my most exciting project, um, or by any means my more, a more difficult project, it was a project that gave me a lot of really great friends that I value. How can the maker community support you so you can carry on doing what you do best? Aw, thank you. Um, I mean, being here is an awesome start. And just, I love hearing from people. One of my favorites is when people build my projects. And someone just sent me like a picture of, they made the base that I made almost exactly. And it was beautiful. And it's like such a good feeling to know that what I'm giving out, like a lot of times I think creators feel like we're like screaming into an abyss. Um, so when we get a little bit of feedback back, like we're very social creatures and we like that. Um, so thank you so much. Hi, Zyla. If money was no object, what would you do and what would you build? If, what was the first half of that? If money was no object, what would you build? If money was no object, an airplane. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm trying to work my, here, okay. Here's the, this is gonna sound weird, but like a teardrop camper was kind of one of my like far out bucket list items for a really long time. And it was always one of those things, I think that's like some of where this, my desire to give this talk came from is it was always one of those things where I was like, when I have enough skills, when I have enough space, when I have enough tools, when I have enough money, when I have, you know, like it's always, there's always a reason to not build that really big project that you're thinking about. And one day I was kind of, I was sitting there, I was sleeping in my car actually, and I was like, why, why don't I just do it? Like, sure, I don't know anything about building teardrop campers or houses or construction in the, of that kind, um, but like, that's never stopped me before, so why not, this is just a slightly larger version of that. Um, but then at the same, on the flip side, once, like I built it and now I was like, oh, that was like one of my long-term projects and I'm, now there, so it's, you know that scene from Tangled where, not to start referencing Disney movies here, um, but they're like sitting in the boat and uh, she's about to see the lanterns and Flynn is like, are you excited? And Rapunzel's like, I'm really scared actually. Um, and he was like, why? And she was like, I've been dreaming about this my whole life and once it happens, like what am I gonna dream about next? Um, and then Flynn says, well like, that's the beautiful part is you, you get to find a new dream, so. That is a part of the, the cycle of building the things that scare you that I didn't really talk about is like once you've accomplished it, it is time to set a new dream on something a little bit bigger, which is also scary. Yeah, nice analogy. Hi. Uh, a worry you sometimes hear about from content creators is this pressure they feel in their lives to turn everything, all of their hobbies, all of their interests into content. Are there any do you feel this pressure and are there any hobbies and interests that you try and keep away from turning into content? That is a great question. Um, also, it's really funny. I'm realizing the reason I'm having trouble hearing everyone is because the speakers are pointed towards you. Uh, so I was like, ah, I'm not as deaf as I thought. Um, yes. So, yeah, making was always a thing that I, particularly in school, it was like a way to escape from classwork, right? And then I turned it into my job. Um, and aviation was a thing that, like aviation has been this constant in my life, like for my entire childhood and teenage years, it was like my pilot's license was the number one thing I was working towards. And then when I bought the airplane and started making videos about it, because like I do want to share that aviation is more accessible than people think, um, I started turning that into, into a hobby. Um, a lot of, I do a lot of outdoorsmanship and like backpacking and rock climbing and stuff. And I don't, I don't, I like make Instagram posts about it now and then, but I don't really have any intention of like turning that into videos because I think at this point when I start videotaping something, it feels a little bit more like work. Um, it doesn't mean I don't love it. It just feels like a little bit more like there's going to be a deadline associated with it. Um, but I've, I've, something I've talked about before is 
my like magic recipe to not burning out or rather like rebounding from burnout has always been to find a new hobby that I think I'm going to get that I think I would be good at that like I will if I put work into it I will get better at it really quickly and that feel I think burnout a lot of times is caused by like you're running really hard on a treadmill and you're not getting anywhere um, and if you have this like new hobby where you know you can progress quickly you start running on a treadmill and you actually do go somewhere um, so yeah picking up new hobbies is like part of part of that cycle Hi, uh, so this is like a similar question, I think. Um, what sort of advice would you give someone who's looking to transition to do YouTube videos full time, like making things? Yeah, oh man. Um, what advice, so much advice. Um, sort out your health insurance before you get started. <laughs> um, especially if you live in the States where everything is a mess. Uh, no, but in terms of YouTube specifically, from a mental standpoint, I think the, it's really important to go into it not associating your own value as a maker, as a creator, or as a person with how well your videos perform because that's like a cycle that will start dragging you down and people can see that. Um, but the other one is, I mean, I think the kind of basics are like, doesn't matter what kind of camera you have, it matters that you're telling a story. And the story is why people are there. Um, and stories can be visual, like my videos are not, the kind of comedy sketch, like they're not, nothing I make is scripted, right? Like it's not a traditional story. But a story is the thing coming to life in an engaging way. Um, and that's the part of YouTube or like video making that you have to focus on because everything else will kind of fall into place after that. Um, and also audio, people care about audio quality more than video quality. I learned that one the hard way. Hi, it's a two-part question, but the second part depends on the first part's answer. All right. I'll try not to be too wordy with it then. <laughs> um, have you ever started a project that you've then not completed? Of course. I'm human, right? <laughs> um, yes. I will say uh, doing YouTube full-time is a really good way to hold myself accountable <laughs> um, because suddenly there's like a contract and a sponsor involved. Um, but you should see like my house projects. I was going to ask it, the second part was then how does that not become not failure in your mind, but when you make the decision that it's not going anywhere, how do you then sort of factor that decision making process to it's time to stop? Or is it more that it just drifts away? Yeah, I would say most of the time, if I, if I still have energy for a project, I will, I will keep like bashing my head against a wall. I don't usually stop because the problem got too hard. I stop because um, I got distracted usually. <laughs> Like some, a bird flew by and like my brain was somewhere else. Uh, yeah. I have a question myself. Uh, so yeah. you're pretty much ruthless with materials. Is there anything you particularly like working with? Sorry. The, the, are, are you having a favorite material or something Ooh. you like the most? Or? Um, I do love composites. I think composites are really fun. I like working with fiberglass and Kevlar and carbon fiber. Um, but... I would say my favorite material is like the, the next material that I'm going to work with, um, particularly ones I've never tried before. So I get really excited when I have like a new medium to work with or a new something to learn. I think like chewing on something new is one of the best feelings in the world. Um, and so there's a lot of materials that I haven't worked with yet that I'm hoping to, you know, in the next year or two. Those will be my favorite materials. Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. If you're a complete beginner, you've got no tools, no knowledge, no skills, how do you go about approaching something that's so overwhelming? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. I'm, uh, that should have been in my talk, dang. You should, you should come like badger me next time I'm writing a talk. Um, how I have always approached like learning a brand new skill is to find a project that really excites me kind of in that realm. So um, like I learned electronics when I was in college because I wanted to make these, I wanted to make stuffed animals that let, would let me hug someone from anywhere in the world. And so I like learned to code, I learned electrical engineering, I learned all of the things I needed to do to get to that end goal. And I think blindly learning things for the sake of learning them can be really hard, at least for me to focus. Um, but if I know exactly what problem I'm trying to solve, 
and I can see a vague line to get there, then I can follow that line and, and learn those skills. And so, like, I always struggle with, like, you know when you have a new CAD software or something, and you start taking the tutorials on, you know, on their website, and I, I don't think I've ever learned anything from any of those, because I don't really want to be, like, drawing a random butterfly valve in a CAD software uh, that I'm never going to use, like the butterfly valve that I'm never going to use. I want to be drawing or learning on the item I am actually trying to make. Um, so, like, for example, if you want to learn Luthery, uh, like, design a guitar, and then now you have, there's, like, lots of resources on Luthery that can get you there, and you're going to end up watching tutorials that are, like, slightly off the beaten path, but as long as you're, like, working towards your project and your goal, it's so much easier to pick up all of the skills and tools along the way. Does that make sense? Um, this is a bit of a ridiculous question. But how, the best kind. Uh, how much wood do you get through? How much wood do I get through? Oh, gosh. Uh, a lot. I really like using scrap wood. Um, so I don't... Let's see. For the trailer, I probably had, like... 15 to 20 sheets of plywood that I rented a truck and got, and then I used that for the next couple, of, like leftovers of that for the next couple of projects. Um, I reuse a lot, so how much wood do I buy would be very different than how much wood do I get through. Uh, but yeah, probably more than the average person. Less than the average woodworker, though, because I do other stuff as well. This is a question from the little one. Hello, She's, little one. She's a big fan. She said, do you worry about making it really, really perfect? Do I worry about making That's such a good question. Um, Thank you. Yes and no. I would say that I, I strive. I think it's very human. And like, we as creators of things are always naturally striving for perfection to some extent. Because we want what we make to be the best that we can make. But... The key to ever being able to finish a project and move forwards with projects is to accept that there will be things that are imperfect. And I think a lot of things that used to bother me, um, I have made enough really stupid mistakes in my making career that I know how to like, you know, cut a little sliver of wood to patch over the part that I probably shouldn't have blasted through with the router. Um, or like correct and I also know that when I hand a final project to, to somebody they don't see the mistakes the way that I see the mistakes and so it's kind of like I think about this sometimes well okay I don't know how many people are going to understand this analogy but like when you're doing your winged eyeliner and you do one side and it's really good and then the other side sucks sometimes I just I'm like okay today is an asymmetrical day like if I keep trying to fix this it's just going to make it worse so no one else is really going to notice um, and I kind of like, that's the same way with making, is sometimes you just got to accept that what you have is what you have, and continuing to move forwards is going to be closer to perfection than dwelling. All right, I think we got it. Any more questions? No? Okay, so we're going to make a break here now then. Give it up for Zyla then. Okay.